see how this does. Well, okay. And nobody's here, but I'm back. And uh, I got rid of the echo thing. Um, there was a problem the other day for uh, that uh, that somebody else had had where they came up twice on their own screen. And then, of course, there's all the hassle of, of, of echoing and all that nonsense. And so I just had that, which bounced me out of uh, my established stream. So I've just come on live. And hopefully uh, some people could figure out how to come back in. So, oh, well. New stream. <laughs> Ridiculous. Oh, Didi's here. Thank you, Didi, for making it by. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. All right. Yeah, that, that stunk. I, I was up on the screen twice, and it was the whole deal. But we're here. We made it. We're all alive. Everybody's got fingers and toes. Fingers. Fingers and fingers. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I will have to delete the other one on YouTube as well. I'm yeah, that's otherwise going to be freaking people out. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I don't know what that was. I don't know what his problem was, but we uh, we we have uh, uh, bested the beast, and uh, here we are. Hopefully, uh, people will be able to make it back. But I'm just going to go about doing whatever I'm doing as I normally do it, and uh, we'll go from there. This is yesterday's page. It is, uh, this was a fun page. This, well, I say that about every page, don't I? But this was fun to do. And the reason that it was fun to do is because I, I said this in an explanation as I posted it earlier. When, uh, when you do mixed media stuff, you're always trying to figure out ways to incorporate a whole bunch of different things. And, um, that's fine. And that's that, you know, that's mixed media art. That's legitimate. But, if you can figure out a way to put a reason for that inside your narrative, inside the storytelling, main goal, that feels so much better. Hey, we got three people here now. I can see that on the screen. I finally uh, pay a little attention now to the fact that there's a number on the screen. I honestly uh, never really did that. But uh, yeah, thanks for making it back, people. Sorry about the problems that uh, the uh, the stream had before. But Anyhow, back to this, the, the page, uh, it felt good to do it. Uh, I've learned a whole bunch of different tricks in Photoshop of late. I have uh, a few different books that I'm going from. And uh, just to show you that I'm a 1,000 years old, I go through the different books and I photocopy out the pages that help and uh, keep them in the book that's got too many pages to photocopy. And uh, so I'm learning things. Like I learned a color hold the other day and... Uh, Little steps, little stages along the way. Uh, as soon as you, it's one thing to have a tool. It's, it's another thing to learn how to develop a tool. Hey, welcome aboard, Philip. Philip Chandler, ladies and gentlemen. Eating lunch. What are we having, Philip? Um, so, you know, uh, as you become more and more comfortable with, with said tool, you should be able to engage a few more little different things along the way that you can do, that you can bring to bring to your creation bring to your your repertoire of skills and uh, and so i'm starting to have a little bit of fun with some of the different effects uh tonight i will be learning the dodge tool i will be uh i will be learning the uh burn tool oh no i know you're saying to yourself slow down with the excitement fella slow down i'm so okay so there's the page Anyhow, we're back on track. Okay, so there's the page from yesterday. And bingo. All right. So uh, here are the original pages. Give me a sec. I've got surprises. So here's the original pages that I did. And it's just a bunch of little fun little things to do. And then you can see from the original page, like I managed to figure out a way to put this as a ghost image behind there and so on and so forth. And um, a piece of construction paper there. And uh, drew these characters on one sheet of paper and then played around with them and monkeyed around with them. So it was uh, a lot of fun. Now, I've started sharing um, the original art for every... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the original art for every page I do from now on on Patreon. That is my Jim Jam. And uh, that's what I'm going to be doing from now on. Okay. 1996, Baron Story... Baron Stories Watch Annual. There's the 1995. That's the back. Okay. This book changed my headspace. And I brought it out because there's a couple things I want to refer to in it. 
if you have an opportunity to find this, okay, it's from Vanguard, Vanguard Publishing, okay, this book, it talks about, it's a number of interviews with fantastic individuals, Neil Gaiman interviews Baron Story, and talks about his work, longtime artist educator in the United States, and... And then it goes on to have an interview with Dave McKeon. Are you kidding me? That's very exciting. And uh, he's uh, he's interviewed by Baron Story, which just blows my mind because it's two of my uh, my favorite artists. And so uh, Dave McKeon, Neil Gaiman wrote the Sandman books. Dave McKeon's the artist of the Sandman books, as well as Coraline. Um, I have an entire, I have two shelves of Dave McKeon. His book, Cages, is uh, probably one of the finest points in uh, comic book uh, literature. And uh, so uh, he also did all the covers for the Sandman books. He did uh, the, day I, uh, uh, the Day I Swapped My Dad for Two Goldfish, written by Guyman. He did uh, Violent Cases, which is uh, one of my favorite books of all time. Anyhow, brilliant artist, brilliant artist, educator in, in Britain. Uh, and then he gets into some interviews with uh, with a couple of more people in here, right? We start talking to some different creators about the Bill, like this is Bill Cobb, right? Another beautiful piece in there. It's, you know, there's some bearing in there too. But this is the thing that gets me, okay? An ISBN number. ISBN 1-887-591. 00-1. Get a gander at that there. Okay. I hope you can find this. But this is the this is the meat and potatoes, folks. Notes part one. This is the little handout getting on in years. 887-591-001. Yep, you got it. You got it. Okay, so this is his notes that he would hand out. All right, to students that started in the early 80s, okay? But this is him talking about art and life. And so this is him starting to break down visual versus verbal thinking, the importance of commitment and sincerity with your art. There are so many little different things, but then this starts happening. And what this is, oh, the one that starts with a nine, is that the one you need? I'm so sorry. Nine, seven, eight, is that in camera? 188-759-1003. Okay. All right. So this is his notes on he talks about comparisons between illustration and other media, but then he starts giving you all kinds of little effects that you can incorporate in your work. And so when he talks about that, he talks about stretching the horizontal axis, stretching the 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 vertical axis. He starts talking about exaggerations and 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 uh, messing with proportions on characters. He starts talking about positive negative space. He starts talking about analogous or um, value systems in, a, in in an image. He talks about symmetry asymmetry, right? And uh, and he just keeps going. This is what I'm referring to when I start talking about some of the things about addition and subtraction, addition and subtraction. This is where it all started for me. And uh, if you can get yourself a copy, please do. But uh, brilliant, absolutely brilliant stuff. That is uh, possibly one of my favorite things ever made. This is something, and I'm gonna, because I'm scanning these and putting them on my Patreon today. This is something I've done where I sit down, 40, $48. Oh boy. Well, it's uh, an incredibly uh, fantastic book. I didn't realize it'd be that much money. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry for recommending something that's crazy expensive. And it's very small too. It was originally, I think, $6. Uh, $8 Canadian. Suggested for mature readers. You know that if you edit a live, the chat goes, you do know that if you edit the live, the chat goes away. I don't have a chat on mine anyways. 
my chat doesn't show up in the first place. I think it's because I don't have enough people uh, watching maybe, or I don't have it in my settings to have it stay on the screen. I'll have to figure that out. Okay, so this is, um, this is uh, what I do for myself, really. And uh, I've done some examples of this lately. I just thought I'd pop them up again. I'm going to stick them on my Patreon. Started with this one. Uh, it was to show examples to uh, somebody that was hiring me for a job. And, um, you know, um, it's just a bunch of different ways that you can make marks on surface and using a bunch of different tools. I have to set it. I have to set it. Well, I'm going to have to figure that out. Thank you, Didi. Yeah, I will definitely have to figure that out. Good news. Okay, I really appreciate that. That's good stuff. I'm, I'm definitely going to have to investigate that more. Jim's here. Break out the Zima. There we go. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. So this is the first page that I did. This is all the different ways uh, you can draw the same image over and over and over and over again. So with that, in and of that, you can have uh, all kinds of uh, different interpretations of the same the same image and you can get different emotional effects and you can get different uh different investment in the, in the reader by with more complicated image or you can you can have a uh, softer images denote other information to that you can have uh you know more tender moments with simpler more uh, simpler approach right focusing on the character's facial expression or something like that but the whole point of all this was to purely to explore the same image in numerous mark making materials and so i've got three pages of it and uh and part of that that i did was a little study on the different values of black warm and cold based on uh, the inks that i had in the moment so yeah i'm going to send this uh stick this out there into the uh, interwebs and get the word out on that for the folks the folks at home okay so uh did i yeah i did show this so monday's page the rock and roll librarians was fun kind of a simplified approach uh more elaborate approach of course with uh yesterday's slash today's and uh so the debate is up there about uh i don't need i still don't i really de never know what uh medium i'm gonna, I'm gonna use until i start using it so i can either uh do digital or do traditional Either one is fine by me. So, uh, the book. Where is the book? Okay, prepare yourself, folks. I, I don't have very many of these left. And uh, and so because of that, uh, I have started sending the ones that I do have left to the wing. So there are people out there in the magical world around us that are going to get surprises. So, brace yourself. They're explosive. Um... Okay, Siddle so at the end of time, good. Honda Towns, everybody knows. Rock and roll librarians, done. I've got cause and effect here. I've got uh, uh, got three suggestions from from Dee Dee today on her channel. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to do them today, but somebody said, that's the easy stuff. <laughs> Immediately after getting the three, three suggestions, but... And I told them I was going to do the opposite of what they thought I was going to do. I said it's going to be about an airplane hopping around like a kangaroo on the wing of an air, uh, or it's about a pyramid hopping around like a kangaroo on the wing of an airplane. Uh oh, I hope everything's okay, Philip. Take care of yourself. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, the other suggestion is a magic car that crashes into anything that looks like a bullseye. That's Corbin. He likes the idea of that. Have I ever thought about putting together an actual art book, a how-to for beginners or intermediate? No. <laughs> I've never thought of that. I, uh, yeah, it's just something I've never, never actually considered. Um, the problem with, I find, with uh, the explanative approach of art, when you're writing it down on paper, the, uh, there's a lot of the same overlapping thing you're going to get in the multiple, multiple books. And uh, Corbin, just come and sit down, would you? Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm arguing with the cat. 
Right here. Get in your chair. Sit down. Shut up. He, uh, he wants his cartoons on it. That's what we call it. And uh, there's... Uh, we have a television in, in, in Lori's yoga room and and uh, we put uh, five hours of, of cat channel on for these ding dongs and so every now and then he comes over and complains like a child can I watch TV I want to watch the TV it's ridiculous um, all right so a, uh, a magic card that crashes and anything sounds like fun to me uh, back to your question Jim uh, no, I've never thought about it because the whole idea of another book that says the same things uh, at the, the beginning is uh, having to sit down and go through putting that material together, I think, is uh, uh, the, the, what holds me back from doing it. I, 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 I don't know. I just, you know, you read so many of those that... Uh, as, as you develop as you as a creative I think that it would have to start at, at, at kind of like an intermediate or or coming at it specifically from the perspective of hey here's all the wackadoo things that you can throw together and make 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 uh, artsy fartsy with so maybe that would be the art book but wouldn't I have to do all the the previous stuff for that the preamble to that I don't know I do not know, but thank you for the question. Maybe it's something for me to think about. You know. Anyhow, I've got uh, the magic car that crashes into anything with a bullseye. Does anybody have a specific request for what kind of car? So that's my magical question for today. Because uh, I have no, uh, no particular preference for cars. Uh, tomorrow, by the way, is going to be a very special episode. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to be wearing all black. And uh, we're going to be listening to Depeche Mode. In honor of uh, friend Jim Luan, who's going to be driving six and a half hours to Sacramento. Sacramento, California. A place that I did not believe was real. It's not true. Of course it's real. But, Yeah. He's going to go and uh, see a rock and roll concert. Is it rock and roll? Do you call it rock and roll? I don't know. Might only be rock and roll, but I like it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, in honor of that, I'll be listening to uh, to uh, Depeche Mode tomorrow. However, today, uh, I am listening to Gogol Bordello. Aren't I, Corbin? Yes, we are. So, if you don't know Gogol Bordello, Gogol Bordello, start wearing purple. Please check that song out for yourself. You could thank me later. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Didi argues with her, her, her cat every stream. I saw you arguing with your cat today. That's fine. Yeah, so tomorrow will be Depeche Mode Day. I'm going to uh, dye my hair really light blonde and cut cut it all at the top and look uh, very... Uh, be wearing a black leather vest and no shirt. And viewership just plummeted. Just plummeted. Come on. All right, you happy? There you go. Hey, everybody, look at me. Hey. Hey. All right. You do you. Go do your thing. Okay, so magic car that crashes in anything, it's got a bullseye on it. If anybody has a preference for a car, let me know. Um, because I, I don't know a particular thing. Hey, look at that. It's Raul. How are you doing, sir? I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be this KG car. Car. You gave me a car. That's the car I'm gonna pick. Some of these cars are ugly. Okay, so so that's the idea, is uh, is to sit down and figure out from 
Uh, yeah, there we go. I'm, and I'm off. So, hopefully, hopefully, you said, there we go. I've got, uh, I've even got directly in front of me a, a stencil with circles on it, and I'm still cranking it by hand. Because I make zero sense. I'm sorry, Raul, I left that up there. Uh-oh, dude, he's got a phone call. <laughs> it's secretly me. No, it's not. Does anybody remember when on television shows there would be a funny, like those sort of bad Bobby Bittman-esque television programs where, you know, somebody would stand outside of another person's house as they're doing, you know, something in camera and they go out and uh, call their friend from outside. Hey, hey, I'm, I'm calling them from outside. Hold on a second. I got to get that. Oh, my goodness. Oh, excellent. 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 Look up the album. Um, uh, I think it's Underdog World Strike is the album. Uh, no, Gypsy Punks. Yeah, Underdog World Strike is a, the subtitle of the album, but uh, that is a phenomenal album. This is something that came up in some stream recently about, uh, I said, have you ever listened to Russian klezmer punk? And that's what this is. It's half the band is in their 50s and the other half of the band is in their 20s and so you've got somebody playing the fiddle you've got somebody playing uh an accordion just rock, this old guy rocking out with an accordion and uh as well as some young guys go you know on your guitars oh it's nuts but uh a lot of fun they've even got uh the the go-go girls on stage <laughs> <laughs> they're insane but brilliantly fun lots of uh lots of debauchery on that stage i'll tell you and uh a, a show i don't know that i'd be comfortable seeing live because you know it'd be in such a small space that uh you'd be very clearly exposed to everybody but you know all right raul what's Raul's question why are meerkats so cute Oh, they got a plan. They got a plan. We all know what it is. Don't trust them. Don't trust them. Definitely don't leave your kids with them so they can babysit them. Meerkats. All right. So uh, I've just randomly, I wrote the word car in which is the level of my uh, searching for reference, folks. I'm going to be honest. Today we draw a car that crashes into anything with a big target on it, okay? So I type the word car. My, uh, my cat is under my arm here. He's just having a great old time. He thinks he's helping. So I'm stretching a little bit of perspective, by the way, and uh, trying to push the value of this car. I want to do, well, I'm so sorry. I'm doing this off, off screen. I apologize. I changed my desk setup a little bit just because uh, I wanted a little more room for doing stuff. And I've done additions to the, uh, the picature behind me. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm finally getting some some surface stuff happening on there. And so I'm, I'm just having fun playing with this, this picture behind me. No real design or plan to it, just painting for painting. And uh, I'm on the active search for um, onion bags. I know that sounds random, but onion bags. It's a weird thing to, uh, to want, but... Uh, So Lori and I are going shopping tonight and stocking up our onions. We gotta go get some onions tonight, hon. I need it for an art project. Okay, I guess so. Yep, it's I love her. She just humors me. She 
doesn't even question uh, question how bonkers I am anymore. If you can find something that's sort of right out right off the of center there, you know, there's so many different uh, cultural things that happen in the world with music and with art that if you can uh, tune yourself into stuff that uh, is is away from the norm, is away from your norm at the very least, I, I always recommend people do that. But that's why, you know, I, I showed the... That's why I showed the uh, Baron Storybook at the beginning. And, uh, and I'm listening to, you know, crazy... Uh, crazy Russian klezmer punk music, but, you know, Judy says her family has quit asking after a while. <laughs> yep. It's, uh, you know, you know, you really got people around you ingrained in the fact that uh, as, uh, as a creative person, there's things that uh, you need to do or you need that, you know, there's a, a reason behind it. And the people around you, they may, uh, they may not. You know they uh they may not get what it is that you're doing but uh yeah, okay yep yep all right we love you you're a weirdo that's where uh that's where poor Lori is but you know that's okay keeps it interesting Okay, so uh, I'm drawing random little cute car. I chose to do a cute car for this project. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's still on the screen. I'm doing great today. So I drew, uh, I'm drawing a cute car with a really pushed perspective on it. And the reason I'm drawing a cute car is that uh, whatever, whenever you're doing something, this is my headspace. Okay, when you're doing a story or uh putting together a script of some kind in any ways for, for whatever way it's going to be executed. The more that you have turned left for you to turn right in the middle of a, in the middle of a, a piece, I think you give more to the viewers and the readers so that it's not the whole, whatever this nonsense that the, uh, the guy who uh, can't finish anything, what's his name? J.J. Abrams, whatever J.J. Abrams is. His notion about uh, defying expectation or whatever that is, um, it's not that. It's not defying expectation because they only expect or they only consider based on information that you give them as a viewer, right? So viewers and readers do not expect anything more other than a little bit of investiture on their part in the material that's been supplied. So this whole defying expectation is nonsense. It's an absolute nonsense thing. But if you are going to do something just to keep them to be interested, to be stimulated, and to maybe, maybe bring something new to the game, um, I like to go left instead of right and then bring it around. And what I mean by that is if... Uh, if I'm going to have a crazy killer car, that the whole thing about this car is that it everything it, it crashes into everything it sees that has a target on it. Any target printed on that, the car's going for it, which means all target shopping stores are, are at jeopardy. Anybody walking across the street with a target bag, it's going for them, right? Or uh, airplanes in the sky from World War II with the target uh, symbol on the on the wings, it'll figure out a way. But so you just take that idea and push it as far as you can. But that's the idea. That's the story idea. But what you can do with that is if you make the cutest car you can think of, or if you make something that's so unexpected to be the crazy thing, like Christine works as a story, sure. But there's absolutely zero point in redoing a Christine with a big, burly heavy, heavyweight car, you know, that's because you sort of expect it, right? You sort of, it's, there's a believability factor of, well, yeah, you don't want to get chased down or hit by this huge car. This, you know, you know, it's going to overtake everybody. 
which is a very different sense than than a tiny cute little car that's going to absolutely self-destruct itself you know every time it hits something it's going to just blow to pieces to me that's more fun that's more interesting and it it just plays off of a off of a different notion it keeps the reader going what in the world that's that's ridiculous the fact it can stitch itself back together again is the part that makes it a little more compelling. And I, this idea came into my head because I got the suggestion yesterday. And this idea came to my head uh, because as I was going to get blood work done, um, this tiny little, one of these tiny little cars went driving it by. And those things baffle me. I mean, I look at that and I think of uh, what, how in the world would I even would I ever be able to even get into that thing? Which is the answer is probably no. Let's just be honest. But, you know, but what if that was a killer car? So somebody gave me this suggestion and I saw that ridiculous car drive by. I went, that's the car I'm using. Because they're, you know, the whole notion that these people drive these things on the highway is insane to me. If you have one of these cars, you do you. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm missing comments. I apologize. What am I missing? Uh, oh, big conversation about mailing. Those tiny cars are scary. They are terrifying. They are absolutely terrifying, GD. The, you know, because there's there's nothing to them. There's, there, it's, it's almost like you're driving. On, it's almost the same dynamics as being in a motorcycle. Because I can't, I, I, I can't tell you how daunting the idea of it is when you see giant pickup trucks on the road <laughs> and these little, little two, two, two person cars go whipping by. Oh my gosh, come on. So, yeah, but that so doesn't that make it perfect to be a killer car? Can anybody else think of anything else with uh, a target symbol on it? Is there, uh, is there any other brands or things that I'm not thinking of at the moment? It's got to be, uh, what's uh, BMW? Is that the one that looks like an airplane propeller? I don't know. That could be, that could be good enough for it. It's all how it registers it, right? But the whole idea that maybe a, a jilted former employee a, a gifted uh well here's a commentary on all the people that uh go and get college diplomas because they've been told this is a thing you get this you get a job and of course you know it doesn't always happen maybe one of the guys that studied uh advanced computer programming or something was forced to work at a, a target and uh, felt so disappointed with life. He decided instead to uh, take down target as terrible employee practices. I don't know. Right. <laughs> Jim Luan says, yeah, but what would Christopher Walken think of those cars? I think it'd be really straightforward. Some would say, hey, Chris, get in this car. No. You know. <laughs> Just no. Okay. So I'm just putting in some of the little forms for this. I hope this is... Uh, it's silly and it's contorted, but it's, uh, it's meant to be cute and silly, right? Meant to be cute and funny. I, I could do better circles i'm sorry but all right the perspective's not perfect but hey it works if people try gogar bordello and they like that i highly recommend that uh if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the band blood sweat 
and tears. So just putting a couple little textures in the in the window there. Something to reflect in. Uh, uh, what am I missing? Uh oh. Uh oh. There's something for you to listen to on your way to Sacramento, Jim. If you're starting to feel, oh, God, this trip is taking forever, put on Go Gar Bordello. You will be there in 23 minutes. Right, well, I think I followed you today, too. I hope it's you I followed or else I'm about to get hacked and spammed. Was just, you, couldn't, you weren't able to follow me here for some reason, so I accepted it today. All right, so here's our first picture of our car. And let me think. I want to draw it from another angle at this point and have it flying through the air. See if I can find any more. There's one. I got a uh, back shot of it. So uh, I think the second panel would have to be would be our, our graduate from, from college. Smiley face. I'll, I'll draw him in. I want to get this plotted out and stuff like that first. And then uh, a split panel shot of him looking completely demoralized. Raised shoulders, smiley face, slouch shoulders, frowny face, target clothing. I, this, is there a target, target outfit? I'll look it up. But uh, I think it's a vest of some kind. So we'll have him standing here holding his engineering diploma. And then that'll be that split panel. So that's our whole narrative that we need as simple and close and, and tiny as we can possibly put it, have uh, us really get the gist of our character story. He graduated from engineering. He works at Target because there's no jobs, right? It's a big statement in a simple panel split across the center with two pictures of the same person. Happy, sad, happy, sad. What does it say? Please, please, please. Any tips or tricks you have for drawing cars? Uh, yep. Hold on. I grab a piece of, uh, scribbly, scrappy paper. I can't believe I have to get up and get this just because I don't have one nearby. What am I doing? And I unplugged my bordello. All right. Cars are something that drives a lot of people crazy. I recognize this, but there's a simple thing to look at cars as boxes, right? Uh, so we're taking a sideways route here today, folks. So if you look at a rectangle, just a nice little old rectangle, and it sounds nice and simple and nice and easy, but there's your rectangle. That's your car. That's it. That's the gist of it. You, uh, If you look at... Now, there's a million different ways to do this, but if you put wheels on the side of it, and, uh, and if you take... Everything about, and look at it like, uh, I don't know if anybody was ever in Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever it was, and ever did a Cub car or a, a, or a, a Scouting car, whatever they're called. Uh, kit car. They're called kit cars, I think. So all it is ostensibly is a block of wood. And uh, you are, with the assistance of your big brother or sister, you drill two holes into this thing around here and here. And that's for you to put the axles through and you attach the wheels to either side. Two sets of wheels. And then the rest of it is entirely up to you and how you go about carving this block of wood into whatever shape you want a vehicle to be. But if you look at, so if you think of that, think of that tactile physical thing. Think of a rectangle, right? Whatever that shape is. 
Okay, and when you think of the structure of a shape, and then you start looking at aspects of how do I round, oops, I'm sorry, I got that in camera. See how the corners here are rounded? Just down here in the front, and there's this beveling that happens around the outside edge. So think about how you can start slicing pieces off the box. And by slicing pieces, pieces off the box, is that when you look at the front of your truck or car, right? Let's do a truck. So if you take this little, this little cut line here on an angle, I'm gonna actually thin this box out a little bit just so it's more uh, trucky trucky like. Carol, okay. So if you take the front part of your car and cut that bevel into it, right? And just you're because you're gonna whittle down the shapes. And as you sit down and you start looking at, and then you're gonna push other shapes out. So as you start looking at the different parts of your vehicle and start putting those together, realize you got a, a light at the front, a light at the front, and you start taking apart the box and assembling the shapes together so it starts to resemble an actual you know, an actual, what am I missing? A whole bunch again. Stretch uh, counter day. Hey, Gary's joined us. Hey, Linda, how are you doing? Okay, so as so when you look at this part of the box or the block of wood, we'll go back to that, and you start cutting these sections off of it, and the reason that I've come at it from the, the center part and not top down is so that once you establish this identifiable direction, then you can start bringing the hood up to the front windows of your truck, right? And then when you look at where the cab exists on your truck, this is an extended cab that I'm drawing. So I've got the window here, the window here, and then the diagonal window that connects here. So you start thinking about and allow little nuances, allow little things like uh, beveling, little little rounding lines. Don't do you don't have to do straight across lines. Do these nice rounded lines, and start thinking about the trim around the glass and all of those little details. All of those little bits of business are going to. Oh, I'm sorry, I still got Gary up. I apologize, Gary. I'm up there. He's saying hi to everyone for a long time. Ah, uh, you have to tell. People, your IG you name that you use too. Oh, I think that's real. Oh, no, I accepted you today, Ro. So you should be uh, on my list. I didn't see it before as to what the problem was, sir. Okay, so as you do this nice little soft rounding to your lines and you start looking at, and the more and more that you investigate the shapes that build up the front of that vehicle, the more and more representative and the less cartoony and i'm drawing this very cartoony because i'm in this cartoony mode but um the more and more of these details that you get into here and start realizing where where the handle is and how it sits above this line that moves across the truck there you could put a little extension onto the cab at the back in order to show more of the the tailgate and the like follow that line through to here but you start defining and developing anything else, you know, any any uh, any other sort of shape that you can think of. So when you're looking at a car, your car is probably going to end up, and then you can start short forming over time, right? So your car will end up. You realize that the rough shape of the car is more like this, and you got the wheels and the wheels, and then you start thinking about where the placement of windows are in relationship to to where they sit inside the body. This is a single door here with an extended cab on it. So you know that the door hugs around that front tire. Whereas with a car, it tends to be more centered instead of just more leaning towards the first, uh, the first, uh, well, four fifths, honestly. But so when you start looking at a car like this and the back seat of said car, and then you start defining all those little details, start looking at, you know, the lines that move across the car. And then it just becomes a case of, so once you get those basic dynamics in your head about how to draw a car, 
it's no different than anything else. I'm a firm proponent of the fact that this, this, and this lets you draw anything. It's, uh, it's something that I teach in the classes when I go to schools. Um, somebody says, I don't know how to draw a tree. I say, draw, draw a rectangle. What do you mean draw a rectangle? I say, draw a rectangle. Because if you can get a, a linear thinking person, a, a mathematically thinking person, to think about a tree as the start of this, then they're on their way. Because then it just becomes positioning smaller and smaller rectangles together. The difference is, and this is the sort of next step you take them to, is that when we look down on our rectangle, right? It's not a rectangle. It's a rounded object, you know. And so as we start taking them into the cylindrical shape, and then our tree starts becoming a rounded form, you know, and before you know it, they're drawing a tree. And with the reason that they're drawing a tree is that as they start putting all these rectangles together, okay, and they start defining in whatever random way that they want to put those rectangles on the larger rectangle, and then you start adding more and more and more rectangles getting smaller as we move along. This is, and this, you know, this follows suit for anatomy too, right? So as soon as somebody starts looking at a tree as this sort of construction, and then you start taking it into the cylindrical rounding shapes, is how we start making them think about their rectangular construction. Then before you know it, you've got people drawing properly defined trees. The short step that develops inside your head over time is that you stop thinking about the construction. Um, you just sort of, there's a thing that uh, Kim Young-gi, if I'm not saying his name right and you're a fan of him, I'm sorry, but he looks at everything inside of a rectangle. He looks at every human form that he draws to be encapsulated inside of a rectangle. I'm sorry, I'm missing stuff. Uh, mail account, see if that works. Uh, DD Rel oh, I'm glad you're helping Ravel out with this DD. Thank you. Uh, great lesson. I'm going to rewatch. Oh, yeah, please do. Um, that's the fun thing about these, you know, these things being on uh, on uh, the YouTube is that you can uh, go back and watch them any old time. And if there's somebody else that you know that, uh, how do you draw an airplane? Well, it's the same. This is the same structural lesson for that. Kim Young Yi looks at everything inside of a uh, inside of a uh, rectangular object, and so when he tries to figure out how to draw any specific thing, he starts thinking about how it is in a box, how it is in a rectangle. But he puts it into a form because he knows once he sees it inside of a form, and that he knows it's just a combination of shapes. From that point forward, then he can sit down and use this knowledge of shapes and draw, let's see, a uh, jet ski. Why don't I do a jet ski? Has anybody here ever ridden a jet ski? I have not. So I start thinking about the different ways that the object works in space. And I think about the different parts of the object and how they work within the confines of this environment. And it's just a matter of piling up these shapes, right? That's step one. Now, step two, and this is the part that John, yeah, Jim young -Gi, Didi loves the jet ski. Excellent, 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 excellent. Um, I think it's a, you're going to get a star. Didi, you're getting a star. If I can find a star. I got, I got it, uh, my one camera in the way. Did it do it? Well, I think it did it. Anyhow, so, okay, so that's step one. He understands it confined within the dynamics of that cube. So if I want to draw the same object at a different point in my composition or draw it in a different way on the composition, what I do is I make another cube. Whether he actually draws the cube on the surface or not is the difference of Kim Young-Li from other people. He doesn't draw the cubes. So what he does, though, is he lays this out. Okay, and he starts thinking about, so here's the structure of it. We know we got this rounded part at the front, right? And we know that we've got these sideboards that you can stand on, and it's got this, we'll put this nice fin-like shape at the bottom, because I think they have those, if I'm not mistaken. 
And then we start looking at the front of the object, how it recedes back here. And we start looking at the handles as they come up and there would be the handlebars. And then we know that we're gonna see the chair where there's the raised floor and there's the seat with its slight raised up area. And so you start thinking about different directional ways that you can draw the same object, right? Didi gave yourself a star. Thank you, Didi. <laughs> so no matter what the object is, you can start to figure out different ways of looking at it, turning it around in your head. But what you've got to be able to do is to disconnect that part of your brain that has to, that has to try to work it out on the paper first. And you've got to connect that part of your brain that sits down and can just use, and maybe this is my brain wired wrong, but here's an example. Nikola Tesla would completely design any apparatus. He would completely design and start to do physical testing of it in his head before he ever sat down to write down his plans or ever sat down to actually building uh, any of these fantastic things he invented over time. So he would sit down and he would troubleshoot. He would know that if I have this, this oscillatory device that's oscillatory spinning around circles, if I have this oscillat uh, oscillating device right here and I have to have this attached to a rooted system. This rooted system includes uh, coiled wire that can be charged up with the electrical um, static charge that's being developed from this oscillating device over here. And then that system can then be wired into there, but I have to have this rooted or mounted to something while this thing free spins. So I'm going to need gears inside of that. And so he starts thinking of all these things inside of his head before he ever sat down and did it. And he knows that if, if this thing flows to too freely, if it's an imbalance in it, it's going to shake this apart and it's going to make the machine break down. That's what his brain would do. And he developed all of the things that he developed by first thinking about how those things and all those, uh, those aspects of those things all correlated to one another. And that gave him a hand. Now, for us, when you think about a car, there's two things you can do for yourself. Okay. One thing is that you can actually get a toy car. There's absolutely everything right with getting a toy car, okay? If you pick up, I'm gonna use my glasses. Um, so if I pick up an object and I study the object and I turn it around in front of me in space, and I look at this object and I think about the different parts of it and how they come together, okay? Now, I want you to imagine a, a rectangle around this, a rectangular cube around this. And if you can do that, and if you can think about how you can take apart that cube, then you can look at this object from any angle inside of your head and how it works within that space. Now, the tricky part, of course, is how do you get that object to all of its moving bells and whistles, right? So when you look at a truck, when you look at a jet ski, when you look at a tree, Everything that's made by mankind is made out of three shapes. Squares, rectangular, uh, I'm sorry. It's actually, it's actually spheres, cubes, and uh, pyramids. But we're going to just start with squares, triangles, circles, right? So you look at anything around you. Stop whatever you're doing for one second. Look around whatever space that you're in. Find something that is round. Okay, look at whatever the round thing is. I'm going to use this um, stencil thing I found. I found three of these today. Didn't know I had them. So I'm just going to clean this studio more. Now, when I think about this circular object, okay, and I hold this in space, and I think about how this works in my hand and how this works in an environment, you know, that's a pretty straightforward thing because it's flat, right? When I look at a clock, a clock is relatively flat, except for it's not. The flat, uh, the flat surface of the clock as it sits on the wall, I'm gonna put that, there we go, in the camera correctly. As it sits on the wall, we know the back of it's flat because it's up against that wall. But at that point forward, everything that comes off that clock bevels and rounds forward. So if I think about the clock, 
okay, with a type of cuboid or rectangle around it. Now, if I think about the clock now, I think about its its placement in space, and I think about how that clock works within this confined environment, and I think about all of the parts of a clock surface, then I start coming together with the circular face of the clock, the way that the clock moves back in the said space, I know that the hands are in the center of it. I know that the hands sit forward. I can start to figure out the shadow a little bit underneath from the point of light as it's coming forward. You know, I'm going to figure out what time it is. I got an idea of a slight diffusion of, of light in here. You know, I know that I'm going to place the, the numbers around the said clock. You know, so you start thinking about all those different little facets of any given object. If you're able to do that, if you're able, able to allow yourself that departure, there's nothing you can't draw. And it's simply a matter of how important is it to you that it looks exactly like the thing? That's that's really, that's the meat and potatoes of it. That's That's the thing that switches from, I'm going to draw a thing, from I'm going to do an absolute an absolute um, replication of this object, this object here in a two-dimensional, maybe three-dimensional form. If you're doing it in a three-dimensional form, there's a tactile sense to it because you can actually see it in 3D form in accordance with the 3D structure that it is. If you're doing it in a two-dimensional form, that's the implication of, of, of form to it, of weight, of, 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 uh, of dimension, right? So anything that you can think of, you can sort of sit down and figure out how to draw. If you have a dinky car, I think they're, they're called, and still, I don't know if they are or not. Um, I'm not a car guy. My wife can look at a car and tell me which kind it is. I'm not that guy. But if you can start to think about any objects, like let's say, look, so if I'm going to do a spaceship, and I'm going to have the spaceship coming down in the front, okay, and I'm going to have... A raised area at the back because it's based on a car you know and i've got my spaceship that uh what is that uh, star trek they have the little ships with the the little uh, engines at the side and so you start thinking about rounding out your forms you start thinking about how those forms interconnect with one another actually i think they've got a flatter front bear with me i'm not a star trek guy so when you start thinking about the structure of this thing, which basically just looks like a van with running boards on the side, you know, you can start to figure out how they design whatever it is that they design in these science fiction movies. And, and more and more time goes by, the more and more complex these objects get. And you start to realize a couple of things. I'm going to show you something, a really fun one. This is the shape of the Millennium Falcon which is a hand. Okay? Now, the front of the Millennium Falcon is a broken triangle. Cut half the triangle off and throw it away. The body of the Millennium Falcon is a circle. So, a triangle stuck to circle. And uh, I've cut the face of that off. I, I'm going to look at uh, the volume of, of the, the ship and how it moves inside of space by allowing myself to, to think of it as a three-dimensional form, first and foremost. And then I'm going to allow this weird little variation that's at the front, which is basically a circle on a rounded rectangle, or a rounded cuboid. So you, if you figure this is all little built cuboids like this, this is your principal circle shape, this is your triangular shape you've cut off. That's the complexity of design. I mean, that's that's when somebody creatively is sitting down and looking at something and saying, how do I make something oblong and different from your expectation of a spaceship to look like some variation on an airplane? So uh, it, it still falls back to the same principle rules that we have here about if I picture this thing within, within a cube and I start to look at how it sits inside of its environment, right? It's, it's all the same underlying principles. 
it's a fun thing to, to, to take a moment to take a shot at. But the difference between a flat image and an image with form and dimension is the difference of, are you trying to draw a tree to look like a flat supplied image of a tree? Are you trying to draw a tree because you're closing your eyes for a second and thinking of a tree? Because I promise you, if you can just close your eyes for a second and try to build that tree inside your mind's eye, and you're like, well, I can't make lines appear inside my head. Well, no, no one can. But, but at the same time, you'll find yourself doing really funny things, like with your hands, and you're like, well, the tree's round, but it's on kind of a hill. So the tree sort of moves up the hill and then it sort of roots out and it gnarls its way this way. And the more and more complex you start getting in your thinking, the more and more this tree starts developing, you know, lines for the bark as it moves across the, depending on certain, certain kinds of tree, right? Birch is, is more like wrapped uh, little bits of, uh, well, you can make paper out of birch trees by peeling off this, this rounding edge. But this is kind of how birch, birch, uh, bark moves on the trees it's sort of this uh, works out to be sheets of paper so as you think about how the tree now that you're in this more complex way of thinking when you think about your boxed construction which then becomes a cylindrical construction step two and now you start thinking about the textures on the surface of your object and if this is a tree am i in camera if this isn't a tree which we've already taken from this we're looking top down Okay, if this is our tree, which we've developed from that, then the realization needs to be that the ridges that are on a tree, the little dispensations of growth for this protect, uh, the protective dermis of a tree, because that's what it is. It's its skin. Okay, it's more like a heavily calcified skin when you think about it. But these, they're little circles. They're just little circles. And so as soon as you start thinking about the bark of a tree like that, and you start looking at, you know, a, a gnarled, falling off my own paper here. That's so we look, so this, the little hill I described to you, that's right here in this flat plane that moves forward and these lines that denote that. So as soon as I'm drawing my tree here now, and I'm following up these lines. Okay. So I'm starting to get into my more, complex tree i know that the underlying structure of the tree is there i understand that it's made up of boxes now cylinders but then i start thinking about how this growth this organic growth of the object from its base up to its top moves throughout right and it moves up into its branches moves up into the next branch and I start to put texture and definition in my tree. Okay. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope it makes sense for people. It's, uh, otherwise, I'm, you know, I'm so great. Just listen to myself talk. Anyways. So, yeah. So, the more and more complex you get, the more and more representational your tree becomes. Because the next thing to think about, of course, is a source of light so if you have a source of light coming this way on your tree how's that going to affect the surface on this side the surface on this side and the surface on the outside how do you bend the light that's a lot more complex let's do that a different time and the reason that i say it's more complex is especially on a tree because we've got all of the little rounded bits all of this dermis that moves around from a tree so when you look at a section piece of tree and you see all the rings of growth, they're not perfect circles. They're not, it's not how it grows, right? So um, that's it. That's the gist of uh, how to book go about doing it. When we start looking at light, we need to look at if this is our object here and our light source is coming in here, then you're gonna see, you know, a dispensation of light on the one side, you know, as it moves around on our circular object because there's no light coming to this guy except for on the surface of the ground beneath it, whatever the color of that ground is, if it's not a flat matted out value, then it's going to cast a reflection onto this surface. 
And so you're going to see this thin line of light on that side that equals to the light that is on this side. But it also contains some of the value from this old surface. If it is a matted uh, surface that doesn't have as much reflective property, in order to have balance in your image, you still want to put some of this value inside of here. See? Too complex right now. Let's just look at boxes. So that's the, from, hey, Chris, home make, draw car is uh, Chris trying to make as best an explanation as he can for it. But I'm saying to you that you can draw anything at that point, right? Um, if you look at, what am I missing? I'm so sorry. I could try to keep up, but I don't do a very good job of it. The click Netflix Power Rangers trailer came on. Oh, okay. There's an app for that. Um, amazing art teachers. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm not... Uh, I, I, I'm not a registered teacher either. I just go into schools to teach about storytelling. Uh, so, all right, so let's throw that over there. Now, uh, this here's my water bottle. And so I want you to look at my water bottle for a second. And what do you see from the top? Don't look at the, uh, I'm not talking about this little fiddly bit. That's just their local branding. But a water bottle is a series of concentric circles as they move down through this object. You see the larger circles as we go down. And if I flip it, and hopefully don't spill it, if you look at it from the bottom, these, these circles, okay, they go to a, they taper down around the neck, they taper back out again for the body, and they taper back down again for the bottom and for the level base. Base, of course, is flat. If we look at it, we can also see that it may be, there may be a bit of a pyramidal shape to it, a really stretched pyramidal shape really a uh, deviled pyramidal shape, but it's in there. The lid, when you're looking at it from the side, it has a bit of a square shape. Um, the more that you sit down and think about objects around you and you start thinking about breaking these down into form, the more that the fear of, because uh, it is an underlying fear, of uh, whether or not you have the ability to draw a thing or not, dispels because you can draw anything. There's nothing that uh, you shouldn't, uh, you should be able to draw anything that you can think of. It just takes the same tricks that you need to get to Carnegie Hall. What are those tricks? Those tricks are practice, practice, practice. It's a Carnegie Hall joke, folks. I'm a thousand years old. So, so that's it. So I hope that helps. When I think about if I have an object, right like a source image of this of this car here which is already a squat car it is but i have stretched its perspective so in this case the perspective of this car is like this as opposed to like this it's a beveled line as opposed to a diagonal and i've done the same thing at the front instead of this but if you sit down and you look at it for a second, you realize that in order to draw this, there has to be that structure in there, right? There has to be. And it's just a matter of cutting away the parts that I don't need, right? But does that, does that help anybody? Is that of any use to, have I gone off the deep end at this point? <laughs> Just come back, Chris. Come back. Just draw the car, man. So, yeah. I, yeah, I hope that helps. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is. And, but the gist of it is uh, this, this, and this. Right? What, what am I... Okay. Linda says, I'm trying to draw trains coming around a curve. I can't get the rails and the wheels yet. Okay. Can, can I help with that? Would that be of, of benefit? All right. So and the reason that trains are fun is that uh, if a track is straight for a train, it's never really straight. If a track is straight, it is receding back to a point in space, right? Now, that's a straight line train. So when you draw your construction for your train at the front, and I'm going to be really simplistic here and say, here's your choo-choo, right? And so there's the front of your train. And as you have this construction, and there's, I'm going to draw a steam steamer. So as you draw your steam construction, 
right? Cylinder, triangles, okay? Squared box front. Here's the part that holds up the cylinder. Okay, so as soon as you start thinking like that of the break, uh, breaking down the construction of your train and recognizing that this raised edge that's over here, that the wheels sit within, within here, the big, heavy, heavy, heavy industrial lead. So as soon as you start thinking about these parts of your train and you realize your wheels are here, encapsulated within it, okay, so that's, that's one thing, right? Um, what the next step that you can take it to is that if you look at, so this is, if we're looking at the train coming straight on, it's pretty straightforward. It's, there's your triangle front, right? There's your, your boxed construction for the support base. You can even have a small access port hatch here. You can have the lantern on the front. You can have the choo-choo up in the top. That's what I call it. So, when you start thinking about the different parts in the form and as it breaks down together and you start thinking about how it structures out to the side and down here in the front so it connects to the the, the point you know that the wheels are underneath so therefore you know that the tracks are here okay um so then when you come around to this so let's try this so we're going to do this angle here we're going to have our train coming around the track in this way so it becomes a case of receding, receding boxes. And what I mean by that is if the front of your train is this box here, okay, and the next, the next part of your train is going to be this box here. That's pretty straightforward. The thing is, what you need to think about is not just this plane of your box. And that's where I think most people get stuck on objects like trains. Because trains are awesome. Let's be honest. I showed a train drawing a couple of videos ago, maybe. Maybe it was Monday. I maybe I you know what day is it today? I think I showed I showed a whole bunch of old uh, pages from different books. Uh, I think it might have been Monday. And in those pages from different books. For a book I did called In the Land of Hyacinth Blues, I drew a train. And so you can, there's an example of how I would go about doing it. But when I'm referring to you, don't just draw the front plane because these are different planes, right? This plane is one, this plane is another. You know, you could say sides, but start calling them planes. One, two, three. Okay? So. If you start thinking about any of your objects as planes, you will start looking at not just how these things fit and shape together, but you'll start looking at, so when you know that when an object of, let me make sure I got this in camera, I'm so sorry. When you have a train going around the corner, I want you to think of this. So if I've got a whole bunch of rectangles going around that corner, Wherever I'm sitting, wherever I'm looking at those rectangles from, and as they're getting smaller because it's going farther away, whenever I think about that, okay, I want you to think about if I'm over here looking at it, what am I going to see? And if you're over here looking at it, what are you going to see? And if you're over here looking at it, what are you going to see? Because you're going to see it's going to look like these boxes are very close together. From this from this perspective these boxes are very spread apart from this perspective you can see the the that this space here is far greater to you than say this one but because of your viewpoint because of your angle you may to make sure that you see this much of this box and whatever it contains because of your angle and when you look at this one you're going to see that corner so as soon as we start, like I said, start thinking about things as form. And as soon as we start thinking about things as not just that's a train, but we think about that's a train. Make sense? I hope that helps. Yeah. So once you do that, you look at it from the top down viewpoint, you're going to see the same thing when you look at it from a forward viewpoint. You're going to see that the boxes are moving like so 
And so as I, I get to my the front of my train, right? And I have the back part and I've got the cylindrical part and there it is there. You know, and however all that connects, well, I like trains. It doesn't mean I know them very well. Uh, and then I think about, well, there's a front to this face. So I want to draw the front of the uh, conductor's bit of business. And I know there's a little overhang a little bit where they stand, right? So as soon as you start thinking about all of those parts and then how your wheels and how many wheels are on your, your different engine blocks and you start thinking about these wheels and how they work and how those were and those those wheels work and you see your wheels are getting smaller because they're following within this line and now they're almost as simple as this as they get around in that corner right so if you allow yourself that if you allow yourself the recognition of the fact that any objects you did that you're defining in space can be structured inside of a of a box right and uh, if you're able to do that, then you're able to do all kinds of things. Airplanes are basically just big old cucumber with a big old triangle at the front. And then we're going to section that triangle down for where our pilots are sitting at the front of it. Okay, round off the tip of it. And then you start looking at that center line that you've driven across that you've drawn driven drawn across here then you start oh i missed paul pope coming in paul paid i'm so sorry paul pope uh drawing also along with you christopher oh that's good good stuff uh, uh oh that's very nice yeah that's oh and thank you Didi. are you talking about the train drawing that's not i appreciate that that's very nice yeah hi paul how are you sir uh oh, no matter what I'm up to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, buddy. Um, so, yeah, so when you look at an airplane and you think about that center line and you think about that little rectangular shape that comes off of it, really squat, really flat, when you look at it from the side, it's a big old triangle, right? And then as we think about this receding cylindrical shape that moves back, and then we're going to put some triangles, cut the tops off them, right? But that's a triangle. So we're going to put that on up there. There's our wings on up here. We're going to put on some big old engines. But they're also cylindrical objects hanging underneath the sides of these suckers. So no matter what the object is, we should be able to sit down and start thinking about how we go about uh, duly doing anything. Okay uh what's next oh thank you thank you for the uh, request linda that's that was very nice of you uh if you're done with this you can also draw hair with shading i can't draw that so good okay ready for this one i'll do a fast one on this one. if this is uh i think dd if you want to learn about some color applications and some really nice way of applying form and with value uh, i think you need to watch dd to color some hair but if this is our head, Didi showed some of this today. If this is our eyes, this is the center of our face, right? And this is our eyeballs. And this is our tip of our nose right here, right underneath the, right out, right underneath the front. And then this is right under here for our mouth line, okay? So there's our face, okay? And this is our forehead, halfway between our eyes and the top of our noggin. Now, if you've got hair, right? And uh, if you look at the sides of your head and realize that, you know, here's your ears working from your eyes. Am I in camera? Yeah, your eyes to, I'll turn that a little bit. I'm sorry for a minute. Let me turn my seat so I can get in there. Um, so if we look at our face in such, in such a way as this, and we start thinking about how everything works together, and, and here's our, uh, the old eyeballs and so on and so forth, and, you know, you get an extra eyeball space in between. Oh, I'm very intrigued. Look at those intriguing eyebrows. So, so as we've got, and our nose comes down, it's so basically a triangle. And then there's our, there's the old face, center of the eyes, side of the mouth, side of the nose, side of the eye. So, the, the side of the recessed area around your eye is the side of your face. And uh, so, as we move up there 
the brow ridge of the old skull. And you think about this is halfway across. This is generally where your hairline starts at the side. And it's only a case of differentiation for style of hair, whether whatever kind of hair it is. Yep, there we go. You do it very, very well, Didi. Very, very well. Yeah, hair is a rough one. So you think about if this is our, our, our hairline that sits around that top brow ridge plate. And fill your head. Here's a big secret to it. Fill your head. Realize that there's this little bit here, like your crow mang and forehead, your, your brow. And then you've got the, the forehead of your body there. There's your hairline, or in my case, way over there. And uh, so when you start thinking about this on the top of your head, and you start feeling where there's like, it's almost like planes moving in this angle, there's planes moving in that angle. And so if you don't just look at it as a round object and you start thinking about if this is my forehead and this is the different ways that my head is coming together on top of my noggin which is a really reductive way to look at it but sometimes this helps people so when you start thinking about it like that and you start looking at your hairline in this regard then that is half the battle of figuring out where the hair starts and it just comes at that point to different shapes, different forms, different volumes. You can break it down to a million little um, cylindrical forms if you have to, if that benefits you. When you look at a piece of hair that flows out and comes back down again like this, okay? So just think about how these lines move within that space because they're in this raised area right here, they're gonna move in tighter with one another as they spread out, as the arc of the line moves back down again. They're gonna space themselves a little bit more and then they're gonna give free form to the direction that they themselves wanna move in. If you move it back up into the area where it's coming out of the side of the head, top of the head, bring it up to the root point, right? Does that help? Um, so when someone like Didi is doing an amazing job in the coloring process of it, they're going to put a dispensation of a deeper value right here and right in here because that's the turn of the curve. If you look at it as shapes, you would look at it as lots of little cylindrical shapes and how they move and think about the same principle of the train, the same principle of the airplane these suckers are getting closer and closer and closer to us. Therefore, they're getting a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger as they're moving through space. And then we got to, you know, look at the complexity of it in that way. If that helps you, then do look at hair like that. Look at uh, any of these hair care commercials. You'll see that fo follicles of hair are like spaghetti. And what's sp spaghetti? But it looks like a, a really stretched out rectangle. But from the top down, it looks like a circle. Arched. Yeah, so I hope that helps. When it comes to looking at the, the way that hair moves off the head, it, it is supplied from these areas and it moves outward. If hair is tight follicles of hair and very curly hair, you know, if you've got uh, really tight curls, just look at them in that regard. As you've got tangled mess of curls like I got on this noggin, just start thinking about how they come out of the surface and they go off and do whatever they feel like doing right now. And if you've got uh, nice and straight here, allow those lines. It's just a case of looking at it, focus less on the hair and focus more on the form that the hair comes out of. If you're building a 3D model, when you first start to sculpt the hair in the 3D model, it's gonna look like one of two things. It's going to look like you've splat a lump of clay on top of their head. And then you've got to break that down. Or it's going to look like they're suffering from an electric shock. And you've got to figure out a way to tame that downwards. Right? So if you can consider hair as the follicles that come out from the surface of the skull, you know, then you're going to start to apply more weight to it. 
if you can think of hair as its own form, like if you've got an afro, your afro haircut is going to come off of the person's face, but it's not coming off their eyes. It's coming off that hairline, right? So she, she got her ears right here. Man, big old hoop earrings, why not? And uh, But that hair is coming from that line here, that line here, that line here, right? So from that side view, you're going to have that person's face, you're going to have that person's ear, you're going to have their forehead, and you're going to have their ear line, and then it's all stylish from the, oh, I'm sorry, in that back of the neck line, right? And so it's all form from there, teased out in whatever way that they want to shape their hair. Any everything can be broken down into that, that, and that, and then it just becomes a case of smoothing it out, sculpting it out, getting more and more complex in all the little bits you put together. Uh, what is it? Surely help. I what rewatch more of your videos. TV to series drawings. I did a lion head. I saw your lion head. I tried to stay. Yeah, no, I saw your lion head. That looked good. That looked good. Cats' heads are tricky. Give yourself a minute on that one. Well, you know, if you're in, if you're structured into a form, like especially in, in your chibi form, you've defined a head in a way, and then you've got the bodies, and the, you're looking at, you're basically drawing children. You're breaking everything down into a childlike state where the kid's got an oversized head for, for the body that they have. And as you're breaking down the form and the body, you know, you've got these squat little proportions in comparison to their big old noggin, right? So the difference between this and this, or I'm sorry, this and a regular sized person, this was in my head, is that you stop thinking about this in such a rotund way, right? And what I mean by a rotund way is, oh, there you go. You said it yourself, Raul. Big head, big eyes, right? And as soon as you realize that that spacing and, and the structure of all that changes as we grow up and as we get older and as we get bigger, and uh, there's there's movement. There's movement and there's change in structure in the face. And then when you start getting into weight and you start getting into mass, you're going to see this feature start to, to droop down over time as people get older because, you know, the, the, the pliability of the skin is... It hasn't got the strength that it had when you were young and, and, and whatever. Um, but uh, so you start to get some really fantastic definable shapes and lines more as people get older in life from the softness of when they're kids. So you start looking more as you're drawing adults at the actual structure of a skull. And that can be daunting. That can be challenging. But again, if it helps you to look at it in a box look at it in a box think about the shapes of it right draw the triangular scope at the front of it whatever it is that you need to think about shape wise within the confines of, of a cube that changes your way of thinking from big eyed little head inside of a big 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 square box with a big old sphere in it it just becomes just changing those proportions uh, Didi showed something earlier today, and Didi, if you don't mind me referencing this, Didi showed something earlier on her channel today, the people that were tuned into it, where she talked about taking magazines, a piece of uh, tracing paper over top of it, and take a Sharpie, and find the core lines and the core shape, the core structure of the anatomy that are in these photographs. And when you, st so ostensibly you're tracing the the photos that you're seeing but you're breaking them down in a compartmentalized way so that you can understand the different parts and how they work together and then she went so far as to to do that definable skeleton where you've got the bits and bobs that come together circle for the elbow circle you know rectangle for the for the arm if you look at little drawings for kids and little kids toys you're going to see all kinds of fun little shapes where they've got toys that look like this 
because this is the really easy and robotic way that you can break down a body. I'm sorry, that's on camera. I apologize. So there's your rectangles, your circles. Okay. And then there's this half triangular rounded contoured lines with a sort of beveled edge here. And there's your hand and you see a lot of toys and you see the little wooden replicas that you're drawing from. They have this structure to them. And the reason that they have this structure to them is that it helps people to understand the mechanics of a body. And when I say the mechanics of a body, I mean the mechanics of a body. Because if you look at, if you look at my, let me see if I can get that in camera. If you look at my forearm, okay? Now with my forearm, it's not just a rectangle. Let me see if I can get that right. I'll do it here. Is that better? Is that, I think that's better. If I show you the forearm that I have, it's not a rectangle. It isn't. You see that there's a beveled line that comes up here and there's a thickening to this part of it. So that would be like a thicker cylindrical form tapering down to a thinner cylindrical form, right? And it's only when you really examine and explore things that when you turn the arm, oh boy, it starts to become a square. You, you see the, the difference, the difference in the taper from a different angle. So once you start understanding structure like that, it goes beyond being just a mechanical part of a body, the little wooden figures that you're drawing, and you start to recognize all the wonderful little nuances and all the wonderful little bits in, in a body. But that doesn't happen tomorrow. And I think it's a really important thing to stress, and I try to stress this anytime I'm talking anyway. That doesn't happen tomorrow. That happens with hundreds and hundreds of doodles and sketches and constant scribbling and constant whatever you're doing over the course of uh, whatever time you're spending doing it. And the level of representation, the level of realism, the level of abstraction, the cartooning of it, the stretching and pulling of those lines in order to make them more animate or to look like they're more in motion, all of those little facets of that comes with your practice leaning in that direction, comes with your facility for drawing based on the application that you're pursuing. And, and by that, I mean, are you trying to draw a representational image? Are you trying to draw a cartoon? Are you trying to draw Simpsons characters, which is a highly stylized cartoon for a specific artist, Matt Groening. And, uh, and then all of the cartoonists that work on the show for years are emulating his style. When they did the Atlantis movie, um, it was based entirely on the styles of how Mike Mignola draws. And, and a really funny thing that happened is that when they fly him to Los Angeles to have this hundred artists that are all drawing all these characters, emulating his style of comic book drawing for his book called Hellboy. And he did Fafood in the Grey Mouser and he did um, uh, Cosmic uh odyssey i think it was called for you know oh see you later dd thanks for hanging out um he did a, a, a whole bevel a, a whole bevy of work but as they're trying to emulate his drawing style and they say how do you draw feet because we can't quite pick up on how you draw how you structure a leg into a foot and it was that, that moment that mike mcnola didn't know himself it, it, he realized i don't know how i draw feet here these guys are breaking down how I go about doing things. And I didn't know how I did some of these things. In fact, I didn't like drawing feet when I was younger, he says. And so I try to figure out tricks of having to draw them as little as I possibly can. But he had to confront that because there's all these other artists trying to break down his style. So again, whatever practice you do, whatever decisions that you make along the way and how you want to invest and how you want to draw, that's, that's fine. That's fine for a train. And what I mean by that's fine is, well, the, you know, you got there's the idea of a train. The level of complexity you want for your drawing is entirely up to you. That works. It looks like train. I, I, I think, anyways, um, that that works for for airplane. Now, you can sit down and do more of a, a wonderful contoured bevel for aerodynamics and and the shape of the the hull of a plane and and make it more and more recognizably realistic, like a photograph or something in a, a video. Um, 
but that's a choice. That's where it becomes stylized choice. And that's where it becomes you, the, uh, the you in your art. So that's, and that's the part that separates your doodles from the next person's doodles. That's what separates. Is this the only one? What did I, I threw the other one, didn't I? I'll do that. Maybe that, no, it is the same one. Okay. Well, um, you know, the thing that separates you and how you work from the next person is that repetition, that development, and that stylization that you have garnished over time. And so even when you go from transitioning, in the case of Raul, from drawing chibi figures, which is uh, cute, childlike figures, for those that don't know, uh, and start working more towards actual representational images of, of, of people in a more realistic anatomy it's still going to have your stamp on it it's going to have your your stylistic approach to it because you've re repetitively drawn the chibis to whatever extent that you have so yeah i i hope that helps i know that that this all started from um how do you go about drawing a car i hope i didn't go flying off the deep end at people um but after a while you stop thinking about the shape like the, the cube. After a while, you start thinking about the square. After a while, you stop thinking about uh, anything more than the application of the forms, just because your brain starts to short step. And the reason that the, my brain short steps the way it does is repetition. That's all. That's all it is, is that I'm making a lot of the decisions as I'm drawing in my head before I put the marks on paper. So I put less marks on paper because all of that thinky thinking stuff is happening while I'm blabbing at you. And, uh, you know, one person isn't any better than the other person. It's just they're on a different journey or a different place in a journey than you are. I'm no better than anybody else. I just, you know, I figured out how to draw things in the way that works for me. So keep at it. Whatever anybody's doing, keep on your path, keep on your learning curve. And, uh, in no time flat, you'll be doing uh, the most fantastic, unique work that uh, you've always wanted to do. You know, you're going to create the things that you want to create to the level that you want to create them. There's a beautiful thing in seeing in seeing uh, individual style. It really is. And I'm going to pick on Jim because he asked me a question in the first place. Jim has a really wonderful style. Please go and look at Jim Luan's animations. Uh, he's got a channel here on... Uh, on YouTube, but there's a really wonderful thing about um, that sort of individuality that comes along as you are breaking down things in the way as you see them and breaking down drawings as a way in a way as it works for you. Because as you do that and you do that more repetitively, then you realize that I don't look like this person that I might have started emulating at the beginning, or I don't draw like this person who you might enjoy and really appreciate their way of doing a similar thing that you are, but they draw differently than you. Now, that's not to say that there aren't tons of people out there that spend their entire day copying other people's work, because there are. And they learn to do their best Mickey Mouse. But a lot of times when you invest that heavily in drawing something else, that someone else has come up with in their way, it becomes more and more challenging to step out of that and do it your way. The best example I can see, I can, I can, I can cite for you um, of a way that this is done right. Uh, Las Bros Hernandez, the Hernandez brothers, right? Las Bros Hernandez and uh, there it is there. Is that, hold on. I'm going to put that in the camera. There we go. The, bro the Hernandez brothers. And uh, they're uh, Mario, Gilberto, and Jaime. And uh, these three guys uh, came up with a magazine together. And they, they, they're they Los Angeles. And they're uh, Hispanic. And they emulated Archie Comics. And Peanuts comics. And they would sit down with the newspaper and they would draw those at the table together. 
and then they would start drawing their own stories in these two specific styles that they were learning to draw from because they had no other facility for learning to draw in the 1970s other than the luxury of the newspaper that the family could get on a Saturday. So they would just pour through it and pour through it. And so that style of the Archie Comics characters in the 1960s, 70s, and uh, the Peanuts characters as for children, you know, from Charles Schultz, uh, really embedded itself in them to different degrees, the three brothers. But, uh, but they managed to take that and carve that into their very own, very strong, clearly stylized voices. And all three of those brothers have three completely separate voices. But the fact that they started from that similar foundation shows you that that's how it goes for people. And, uh, the, and the comics are good. Uh, love and Rockets. That was their comic book. Really set uh, a tone and really proved that uh, independent creators could come up with something that uh, defied the mainstream medium, uh, the mainstream uh, companies, and had success in its own merit. And they were telling stories about what it is to grow up in the in uh, South Central Los Angeles and in, in the, uh, the barrios in, in Mexico and and uh, these fantastic exotic adventures that involve space things and coming into the situation, coming out. Um, one character is a fawn. There's no explanation for it whatsoever. He just has short nubs in his forehead where there would be horns. And uh, he's all about tempting everybody. It's, it's So there's just fun, fantastic inventions and these wonderful leaps of thought and logic. But they started from all drawing Archie and, Peanut, and uh, Peanuts, Charles Schultz, Snoopy in the game. So yeah, uh, I hope that helps everybody. Uh, this has been fun. Uh, I will get back to drawing this tonight and uh, get this page finished off. What is it called? A magic car that crashes to anything that resembles a target. So this is going to be a fun one. Um, is it going to be a tale of woe and revenge? I don't know. I try to take real logic leaps every time when I'm drawing these comic pages. I try to really differentiate one story notion from the next one. Today's was silly. And yet at the same time, a little melancholic. Um, and uh, yesterday's was uh, rock and roll librarians. So you got to have fun. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, right? Uh, okay. Okay. That helped. If uh, if anybody needs anything else like this, let me know. I have absolutely no problem uh, talking you through whatever questions that I might have some ability to figure out with you or for you. And uh, to uh, to example for you, I mean. And uh, if that helps you in your process, uh, Linda, I, I look forward to uh, to seeing uh, your train. And Raul, I look forward to seeing your progression and developing out of the the chibi background that you have and and uh, jim i always look forward to your your animations and, and and everybody else that's tuning in today i uh yeah enjoy your creating enjoy doing whatever you're doing i, I really like to see it please feel free to send it to me with that i'm going to sign off for today and uh, go and clean up all this post edit stuff you know because of the little snafu i had at the start of the of the uh the stream today and thank you everybody for showing up and coming in that was really nice yes and despite the chaos at the beginning hey thank you Linda. hey thank you jim uh let me say she'll post on instagram when she gets them done excellent look forward to it yeah everybody uh follow each other if you can why not doesn't doesn't kill you uh and that way who knows what you're going to see that somebody does that might answer something that you've been asking yourself through whatever journey they're on in their work that's the purple i've been looking for start wearing purple wearing okay i'm out listen to google bordello they're crazy that's it for today gang i'll be back tomorrow at two o'clock thank you very much <laughs> thank you jim jim enjoyed depeche mode buddy you're gonna have a depeche mode episode in honor of you tomorrow bye gang <laughs>